how to analyze data and move apps and I would like to show you that in uh, daring to do a live demo. So you enter moveapps.org on your browser. You have to always log in, it's free, but you have to register. And the first thing, you can have a look around at the, the landing page, what is around, what are our news, uh, what is our mission, what are apps that have been used a lot. Um, but if you have a certain analysis in mind for which you want to use move apps, um, you can look in the app browser where all the apps that are presently available, they are made, I think Anna will give you the exact number by 25 uh, different app developers, so also volunteers, colleagues, us, and they are all listed here with uh, categories, with um, keywords. You can search for the keywords. For example, if I want to know about stationarity, I look for stationarity apps, uh, and I can see there are three of them that I might want to try out. You see also already here that we have apps that are R apps, so they are coded in R. Input output types are move to um, uh, objects, but we also have um, apps that are coded in Python. So these are the two possible languages right now um, where the input output types are moving pandas um, trajectories. But Anna will talk more about that. So if I want to build a workflow, I go here to workflows. These are all the workflows that I've done before, but I want to create a new one. I have to give it a title that I have to can find again. Um, <coughs> oak analysis, maybe Animove. And if I want to find it again, there are um, categories that I can define. I just use the one tutorials. And um, then the first step I have to do with this empty workflow is to select a data source. In, the, in this case, I want to load my data from MoveBank. And to be able to do that, I first have to link to my MoveBank account. I have already linked four different MoveBank accounts, so that is also possible. So I have to select one of them. It doesn't matter so much because the data that we will use are uh, free. Live track stock. Southwest Germany. So I select a study on MoveBank and I select um, for the sake of time just a few uh, individuals where I know um, that something has happened. So you can help me to find Julia Niels. Niels is there and Ronja. The kids that are here often helping with uh, tagging the storks, they think about these names, which is uh, a nice feature. Ronja, uh, where is she? There. Okay, then I go to next. And here we, in the MoveBank app, we have a wide range of things that we can select. In this case, I only want to download data from 2015, January. Oops. until March. <clears throat> and I only want to use GPS data. And since these data are rather highly resolved, I would downsample them to one position per 30 minutes. And all the rest I don't care about right now, but please have a look. There is possibilities to download most recent data to include or exclude outliers and, and uh, other things. At, at the end of this uh, kind of app interface, there's a small overview where you can see uh, which animals have I actually selected, which times, and so on. And then I can already start the workflow. Uh, you then see that the app here, the blue block, is idling and it is working when it is green and in the end it's post-processing but while this is doing it I can already uh, see what do I want to do with my data. I first want to um, remove outliers because 
there can be errors in the data. There's the remove outliers app where I say, okay, whenever the stalk was seemingly faster than 25 meters per second, I think it, it was not really a position, but it was an outlier where you see kind of a spike. Then in all, in most data sets, um, we also have a variable that indicates what the location error actually is. Uh, in the case of EOPS tags, which these stalks are carrying, this variable is called EOPS oh yeah. numerical something. Maybe yeah, somebody can help me. Yes, it's up there, right? Yes. Yes, so I copy that and I add it to the settings. <coughs> And I want this to be less than 100 meters. Next, after removing the outliers, I think uh, one very simple way of uh, looking at stationarity is um, looking at distance moved. So have they actually moved a lot during the, um, during the day or not? Where well, Anna has made a nice app where one can uh, look at the maximum net displacement per day in meters. So that's calculated and appended to the data. Um, I can run this workflow again, but without the first app. So I pin this app, so it's not run again, but it's still keeping its data. So it continues running here. Um, and the last one that I wanted to show you is the email alert app, which uh, pro produces a message that is added to an email that you might get if you do these workflows. So you let them run every day, you get an email, oh, this is, uh, your workflow has finished, but with this email alert, it will also tell you our five individuals seem to be stationary. So you might want to do something. And if you get an email without this message, you know, oh, everything is fine. And this one is maybe a little bit more complicated because I have to give the name of the variable because it's a very general app so whenever distance move was less than 20 meters I want to be notified that there was a low rate so this will appear in the message in your email and individual name deployment ID and distance moved will also be uh, shown in the email alert. So I continue running it again with the pin feature. And one thing I wanted to also show you that after running, each app is showing a green blob here. We call that the cargo agent, which is giving you an overview of your data. So it's telling you a bounding box of the data after this app has run, the projection, the timestamps range, and very interesting usually the number of positions. Then you can see if you're filtering, for example, what has actually happened. I had 7,000 points before, and now I have only 5,000 something. And there we have an error. When there's an error, we get a message pushed through from, uh, from R actually, that you can see. You can look at the logs that show you exactly the view that you would also see if you were running this on R with all the messages. And it's probably telling me that I have misspelled some of the, um, some of the settings, which is why I was so scared doing this live. Distance moved. This one is wrong. Maybe I just remove it, okay? <laughs> Distance moved, is that correct? Okay, can we try again? Um, but of course also other errors can happen in, in apps, either because your data is a strange edge case that the app developer has not considered or something is wrong in the app. And then what we usually, why is this not? What we usually advise, also in the error message, you've seen that in the red bar above, is to make an issue on GitHub to the app developer. Um, okay, let's just 
ignore this. But um, how the data actually look like? We have a very nice leaflet app. Gives you an interactive map. <coughs> While this is running, I wanted to also show you how it is actually using and integrating Python apps. So a very nice feature of MoveApps is that you can have code of different languages running in the same workflow. We have these so-called translator apps that transform the output of an R app, for example, into an input for a Python app. These are This one is the Move to Location to Moving Pandas app. And I can here then maybe give you there's a movement hotspot detection app that one uh, volunteer from our last year um, coding challenge has made. Can I somehow move here? Ah, I see. And this one has not run because I was too slow. And what you might also uh, like to see or notice that each workflow has a name, but then there are instances. <coughs> so each workflow can have different parameter settings to the same flow of apps. Um, and I will show you that to you in a next example. But for example, here you can see the output of the R of the Python app, where here you see these three stalks. They had a movement hotspot in these three areas. Um, and similarly, I removed the pin. Uh, I have lost. the interactive map stops working when you pin. I've learned that now. Okay, but it would give you a similar map in a UI um, output where you can then also uh, zoom in and zoom out like, like in the HTML that you've just seen. Okay, we don't need to show an additional workflow with errors, um, but I want to show you how to schedule workflows. There are these uh, three dots to the right here where we can say schedule an instance. So only this instance of the workflow will then be scheduled, not all of them, if there are more than one. And a workflow can run be run monthly, weekly or daily. Let's select daily every, even every two days, every one day at a certain time. I selected maybe 2.20 at night. It's always using my um, local time zone, so that's also written here, and I can schedule it and it will run at 2.20 tomorrow and do that uh, for I think 30 times we have a certain quota, so you have to renew every time so our server does not get overloaded. We also have just recently added a notification feature where um, you activate, like if you have a workflow that potentially runs very long, you activate this and then you get an email saying, ah, your workflow is finished. So you don't have to continuously keep watching what's going on. Especially for CTMM apps, this, uh, this can be very interesting. Um, workflows um, can be shared with other users. Let's go for the, for the error one that Anna provided for me to show you how errors actually look. Um, and you see here there are two different instances of those. And this one I would like to share with a colleague so that he or she can also use the exact same workflow. So I have to go to workflow. There. And I can have to give a small um, description of the workflow. I search here, maybe Anna Scharf is there, exactly. I share it with her. 
um, I can select which of the instances I want to share with her and there will also always be a data source message so telling the people receiving it which uh, input data were used but not adding them because for those you need access on NoBank. But you can add a small message, hi Anna, and then um, I click save and share and she will uh, receive this workflow. It will look on the other side something like this. So I've um, just for you guys um, shared a workflow with myself that I then accept. I can directly go into it and then I see here that I need to configure the data source setting. So it's not, I cannot automatically run it. It will not do anything because there are no data because I, as the receiving person, have to add the data. There is now here a lot of data. I will not let this run, but let to, just to show you, I again have to select my MoveBank account, um, find then the study, select then all these animals, and I have all this, this output um, details that I can, um, can add in the end and then let it run. All the settings of the other apps, they are kept, so from the person sharing this with me. Um, there are furthermore also something called public workflows, so workflows that people have made and shared with everybody. This is a kind of really helpful if you're holding a workshop or if you're publishing a workflow, I will come to that later, you can put them here and forever and ever in this version, as the apps are now, people can add these workflows, copy them to their dashboard, use them. Um, I just want to show you a bit of an older one, doesn't matter which one. I add this, so first you can look at the details that the person providing this public workflow has shared. There might be also uh, a PDF here, I think Anna has uh, shared this one. Um, but if I want to add this to my dashboard, oh, I'm on the wrong screen, I go to add and I can again directly um, access it. It will be stored in a folder which is called public shared workflows. So you can find it again and you can put it into another folder if you wish. And then there is the workflow and you might have already realized in the list of public workflows that there was this, this little yellow deprecated sign with that workflow. That means that there are some apps in this public workflow that the app developer has decided to deprecate either because he, cannot he or she cannot maintain it anymore or because it has made another version. In this case it is because we have changed all the apps from move to move to because of our changes. Um, but they are still running only they are not maintained anymore and if they need to interact with anything uh, outside of move apps they might uh, run into problems and uh, again also for public workflows the data source has to be configured before it can be run um, maybe i show you also the <coughs> message so the the app developer that has deprecated this app um, can give a small message here, it says transition to move to finished, please note that this app still runs and existing workflows and has suggested to replace by movebank location, now this is now called movebank location move one. And one can go there directly and see what the, this other app is all about. Just two more features for uh, Anna is Telling you about how to actually make an app. Um, doesn't matter, just any. Uh, you can also publish workflows. So you click on archive with DOI and you have to fill in all kinds of metadata of this workflow, who are the authors, under which license do you want to have it published and so on. If there are some funding things that you, you want to address or references and then when you click here, save and archive, this, all this data, including all the data about the uh, apps and workflows, will be sent to the, to the university library. <coughs> that will then assign a DOI to it, get back to you if you have any problems uh, with the workflow, and then it will be published, which is some kind of really nice feature in the way of reproducibility. 
Um, and finally, one feature that we have is to, that any outputs of apps can be sent to a web page um, via our API. It's a little bit more complicated, but just to show you where to where to find this. So here is this API access button. You click there. Um, usually you get some uh, registry and password keys that you then can use to actually access um, these uh, outputs. I think this workflow just hasn't been run now, so it doesn't um, work. But um, please have a look at that as well if you want to if you want to integrate some of your results into your website, maybe showing every day how how the map has changed of, of the tracks that you want to to uh, to show. Um, do we have time to show a shiny app? Yeah. Just as a kind of last teaser, I want to show you how um, shiny apps are nicely integrated here and uh, people can interactively work on those or look at those. Uh, I'm again on the wrong screen. Hmm. Okay, let's see. So this is the stationarity dashboard app that um, another volunteer has made on the, on the coding challenge last year, um, which we used also to look at the stored data to find if there's anything wrong with them, if one of them is stationary or not. Um, so after the app has run, one can click on open app UI and then whatever the app developer has decided to put in this UI is, is being shown. And uh, this was uh, one stalk that had some problems in a trash dump in Spain and was released again and unfortunately died before ever being able to um, finish its travel to, to Africa. But uh, so this is all possible and uh, we hope that you find it helpful and are now very motivated to also love some apps and uh, contribute here. Thank you. You have some questions about the user part, the developer side of things. Yeah, no, just speak. Okay. Take the mic. Or take the mic. Yeah. Um, I saw there is the API. To which extent is already integrated with uh, platforms like Earth, uh, Earth Ranger? I don't know, just because I yeah, yeah. I know how <laughs> in theory <laughs> it's ever. Um, so with Earthranger we had we have some collaboration and they prefer to have the outputs of our apps pushed to them rather than they pull it via the API. Okay. So they have themselves made an app which is called Earth Ranger Integration that you can add to any of your workflows that will then push the data coming out of the, of the previous app to to Earth Ranger. You have to contact them for some password and IDs things to add as settings in this app. Yeah, we work with them for the things and for example alert of lions going out or things like that. But okay, brilliant. Uh, and just one thing to um, as we say the schedule is limited. Uh, let's say I'm interested to see clustering of uh, possible kill sites um, from the downloads of the last 24 hours. How, how fast is the processing of the data? I mean, if I receive, because this data comes at six o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. um, if I schedule that this happens, should I wait I mean, minutes it, it to... how big your data are. Well, no, it will be small because it will if be... It's small, then it depends. Like there's usually a few minutes for transferring it to move bank. And then is there's, I mean, you've seen the workflows running now. Yeah. They were also not super simple. So a few minutes. Okay. I would say yeah. if you have millions of data, it might take an hour. No, no, no. I mean, I understand. I mean, if I did need a bigger analysis, I understand. But more on the 24 hours routine, I think you would. I would try it out. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you.
<coughs> with the, I think I just missed something, but with the, no. with the shared workflows. Yes. Is it that um, both users' edits are kind of visible to the other person? No. Or it, okay. It's a copy. copy. So you're copying it. You can do whatever with it, whatever you want. Cool. But you can't go back. So you cannot say, go back. It just happened to me. Somebody uh, shared a, a workflow with me because it was giving errors. And then I didn't have access to the data that this user was using. So I thought, like, I'll just use another data set. And then I had to change some settings. And then I was like, OK, this doesn't give the same error. And I couldn't go back. So I had to ask the user, could you share again, please, the workflow? Because there's no, no way back once you change. I see. Thanks.